Do we want to share with you? Oh yeah, I'm happy to do that. That's fine, I can see some. Turn our cameras on for a minute. Yeah. Hi everybody. Hi. Hello. Admitting everybody slowly but surely. Uh oh, I killed it. Yeah. I can smell this cheese. I know. This is Smith also. Mm. That's good. Yeah. Mm. I've never ordered cheese from you before, Julie, and I love the box with the big stinky cheese alert label. <laughs> you know. I love it. <laughs> That became a nest like a total necessity because FedEx would receive the boxes and they yeah. would smell them and they would throw them away without asking, calling, anything. And so we had to put it on so that FedEx would stop throwing away all of our cheese. Yeah. I loved it. But it reminded I'm glad me it worked out. Yeah. Reminded me of this this book that I had when my son was younger called The Stinky Cheese Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. We're going to get started. I might have to admit a few people here in front of us. There, um, as we go on. You'll notice that I have two screens. So from Asher Kitchen, um, and I am going to, as you see, Julia Holman is also up there. So as we go along, I'm going to be using that screen to kind of highlight some of the cheeses if we want to get a little bit more up close and personal. So I'll let you know and give you a heads up when we do that so that you can find it on your gallery view. Um, this event is really for you. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, we are going to completely geek out tonight um, and go into kind of the nuances of enjoying chocolate and cheese together. Um, and I highly encourage you to ask questions. There are no silly or dumb questions at all. So if you hear me say something and you're unfamiliar with the term or you just wanna learn a little bit more, no. by all means, you can unmute yourself and ask. If you want to um, brought something for hop you? onto the chat yeah. box, you name? can do that. Yeah. Um, and mm. so really whatever makes this experience um, best yeah. for you. All right. So I everybody, I you, hope you guys your cheeses not, right, and fine. chocolates out. Is that correct? So I got two extra. All right. I am just going to start out by muting everyone. And then as you have questions, you can unmute yourself, use the chat box, whatever you think, whatever you, whatever makes sense for you. Um, so I have all of my cheeses laid out in front of me and chocolates. Um, so I encourage you to do the same if you have not already, um, some sort of beverage, uh, you can do a nice crisp water to help clear your palate or, um, a little bit of wine for Valentine's day. Um, happy Valentine's day to everybody. Um, so just really quickly, um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Julia. Um, and I am as of December 28th the new uh, owner of Formaggio Kitchen. Um, thank you, thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, so I started actually at Formaggio Kitchen uh, about almost 16 years ago. I, it was supposed to be a three month job. I was working in public health and was planning on continuing that path. And after three months, I decided to stay on a bit longer and really the rest is history. I kind of, it snowballed. I fell in love. And after, you know, about five years, I realized, oh, this can be a career. And um, I guess the rest is history, as they say. One of, I feel like I have a um, really unique and always had a unique position within the shop in that I was one of the main buyers and importers but I was also a cheesemonger. So by day, I would eat cheese all day. And then my other job, so to speak, was to seek out all these incredible products from around the world, including chocolate. So my mind, as I was on the cheese counter, I was always thinking about these incredible things that I had tried. And I had those flavors in my head. And then I was tasting cheeses. 
And it really became natural that I wanted to experiment with them and put them together. The whole um, beginning of the chocolate and cheese class actually was probably about 13 or 14 years ago with a young woman who worked at Taza Chocolate, who happened to be my neighbor. And Taza Chocolate was a very young, brand new chocolate company at that time. And she said, you know, we're, we're really trying to branch out to cheese shops. I feel like our chocolate would be great with cheese shops, but we want to pitch it. So, you know, do you want to bring some cheese home? I'll bring some chocolate home and we can kind of see if they work together. And so she brought the chocolate, I brought the cheese, and we started experimenting with what really kind of originated as this sort of forced idea of like, let's make this work. And then when we started pairing the flavors together, we were like, this actually really works. And when you break it down to its most simplest version, it is salty and sweet. You know, we can, we're going to micro analyze all the other flavor profiles as we go along. But at its base root, that's why it works so well. And so we're going to be doing some really fun pairings tonight. And our event is going to last probably 45 minutes to an hour. But again, ask as many questions as you want. It's all for you. Um, and we're going to be thinking about how to pair things together, why they work together. And I encourage you to experiment and mix things up a little bit. You know, we we provided enough cheese and chocolates that you can play around and see, you know, maybe this cheese actually works better with that chocolate or vice versa. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Um, and as far as the order in which we are tasting, that is what we're gonna do first. So I am gonna talk a little bit about the order in which we are going to go through this tasting. And I'm going to use my phone, but you don't necessarily have to have the visual. So we're starting our first flight. We're doing three flights tonight. Our first flight is going to be this one here, which is Brebi Duot Baron. And that is your sheep's milk cheese. And that is going to be paired with the Amade Toscano, the red fruit. Um, that's the very sort of bright red, colorful, the most Valentine package of the bunch. Um, the second cheese that we're going to be doing is Comte uh, Fort Saint Antoine. Um, and then the chocolate is the Di Barbero hazelnut bark. And so that's the one with the big chunks of hazelnut in it. Last but not least, we're going to be doing the Blue de Basque and then finishing out with the Maru Lam Dong. And so those are, that is the order of the evening. But if you get confused, let me know, give me a shout. You can hold your cheese up to the uh, screen and I can help identify it. Um, and we'll just keep rolling. But really all of these should work really nicely with each other. But um, I'm very excited to start this curated pairing. Okay. First and foremost, I want you all to get eating. So we're gonna start with a little taste of this brebi. When you do a pairing, what's really important to think about is trying the elements separately. So we're gonna try the cheese first and think about the first word that comes to your head when you try the cheese. And kind of remember that, write it down. If it could be anything, it could be bright, it could be summer day, uh, it doesn't really matter. And the key is when you're talking about vocabulary with food, a lot of people get really nervous and are afraid that they're going to say the wrong thing. There's no such thing as saying the wrong thing. And as we start talking about the flavors that we taste, a lot of you will see something and say, you know what, that's actually what I meant to say. And as you're really opening up about what you're tasting, you're going to develop more and more of a vocabulary. So it's really fun to taste with people that you know, and that you love, because then there's just zero inhibitions, and you can just say what you think. So the way to taste is, um, we're going to think about this as reading a story. Um, that is the flavor profile of anything that you should taste. A good story has a very good beginning, something that captures your interest, 
uh, something that's exciting, and then a very strong middle. You know, you've you've made it fast past the first part, but you really want a nice solid middle part of the story, and then has a wonderful ending. Do you keep thinking about it after you finish reading it? Does it linger? The same is true of a good either cheese, chocolate, wine, literally anything you taste, because it shouldn't just be one note. The finish shouldn't just drop off into nothing. It should really have nuance all the way through. So what we do, um, this is a cheese where the uh, rind, you can eat it. Um, it. This is probably the oldest cheese that I would eat the rind, which is about nine months. Um, rind is essentially old cheese. It's just the part of the cheese that's the most exposed to air. And so a lot of times people say, can I eat the rind? Do I eat the rind? The answer is yes. Give it a little nibble. If you think it makes the cheese taste better, then eat it. If you don't, then don't. That's my kind of rule with rinds. So the first thing we're going to do, I've had this cheese out for about an hour or so, which is ideal because you want it to warm up. If you haven't let it warm up, a good trick that actually a lot of English cheesemakers do is they'll tear it off. And if you've got kids, this is fun for them to do. Tear off a piece of it and actually mush it in your fingers. And what that does, it seems really silly, but what it does is it warms the cheese up to the right temperature. And then you smell it and you can smell so much more of that aroma once you've broken it up and warmed it up and then you enjoy. My dog will be reaping the benefits of what I've accidentally dropped on the floor, so. All right. <clears throat> So this is a sheep's milk cheese from the Pyrenees called Brebis du Haut Baron. Um, and I'm gonna, we're gonna taste the chocolate next and then I'm gonna go into detail about the two. So the chocolate, when you have a piece of chocolate, when it's dark chocolate, what you wanna do is actually give it a snap. And I hope you all heard that. A really good snap is an indication of a really well-made chocolate. It should have a really sharp snap because that means that it's been tempered properly. And that means um, how the chocolate is actually uh, cooled in the form that it becomes. So this is a chocolate with red fruit in it. Uh, this is made by Amade in Tuscany. Um, and this is a producer that's out of Northern Italy and they make bean de bar chocolate. And what that means is they are actually bringing the whole cacao beans in, roasting them, winnowing them, conching them, producing the chocolate almost from very, very start to finish. A lot of chocolate makers, especially in Europe, just buy big blocks of chocolate. They melt it down and they just add stuff to it or they make a pretty design on uh, the mold and that's how they sell their chocolate. Now, I'm, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but you lose the nuance in the roast profile. You lose the control over how that chocolate ends up tasting. If you think about really fine coffee, uh, the single origin coffees, you know, from Ethiopia or Guatemala, they taste very different based on not only the origin in which they've come from, but also how the coffee roaster roasts the beans. The same is exactly true of cacao and chocolate. So really great Italian uh, bean to bar producer. She started doing this way before it was popular and especially before it was popular in Europe. It just is very, very uncommon to see this in Europe. So with chocolate, you also want to smell. Smell the aroma. With this, I feel like because of all the red fruit, you get a wonderful balance of the red fruit and the chocolate. Chocolate melts at 98 degrees, so we are in great shape. What I like to do is chew it up and let it sit on my tongue. And then you swallow and enjoy. But if you really make sure to kind of chew it up and let it melt on your palate, 
different parts of your mouth taste different things. You'll notice that you taste more of the chocolate part. I'd say it's a heavier flavor and it, it sort of tastes on your lower part of your palate. Whereas all those really high toned fruit notes I get on the roof of my mouth and I'd say to the top of your palate. So I always often think about food um, in location and I'll say, oh, that's very high toned. And oftentimes what that means is that it's hitting the top of my palate and that's how I translate that. And so that's always made sense to me. And so whatever makes sense to you and how you would verbalize that um, is the way to go. Now this, going back to the cheese. So now that we've tasted both of those, hopefully you've captured in your mind a flavor profile that really jumped out at you when you tasted each. Um, the Brebby Dolt Baron is a sheep's milk cheese and the Pyrenees is an incredible place, uh, the very, very, very South of France bordering Spain. And I was very lucky to go backpacking there actually with Sarah from Taza Chocolate. Um, we went backpacking there probably about 13 years ago and it was incredible. There's no fences and there are sheep everywhere. Um, and there are sheep just roaming all over the place. And there are little shepherd's huts and we are hiking a trail. And what is incredible is that you would see a sign that said Brebby. And so this is Brebby d'Or Baron. Brebby means sheep cheese in, uh, in French. And so you'd see a little sign that said Brebby. And obviously we followed the sign that said Brebby. You know, there'd be a little hut. And there'd probably be about 10 wheels of cheese in the hut. No one was in there. There'd be a cutting board, a knife, a cloche over a piece of a wheel of cheese that's already been cut, a scale, a money box, a calculator, and a little chalkboard that said euros per kilogram. And it was just to cut your own, you know, for people who were on the trail and you just cut your piece of cheese, you'd wrap it up and you'd continue on your way. And it is the best way to represent and explain how these shepherds still operate in the Pyrenees. And because of that, um, what is the way that cheese is distributed to us? You know, you wonder how do we get cheese from the Pyrenees when they operate on such a small scale? They operate what's based on a deem system and that's spelled D-I-M-E. And what that means is it supports these small little shepherds who uh, don't necessarily have the money facility to age and ripen cheese, but they have the sheep and the ability to make the cheese. So what it is, is the shepherds will make the cheese. So say I'm a shepherd, I make 10 wheels of cheese. I send it off to an affineur. The affineur is the person that ages the cheese for me. In this case, um, it is Christian Pardieu. Um, that is why it's called, um, it's Brebby d'Or Baron, aged by the Pardieu family. And so the affineur ages the cheese. Uh, and then after the aging is done, I had sent him 10 wheels. He sends me back eight wheels. I never have to pay him up front. My payment is in trade. So he keeps the wheels and then he sells them to Paris, to the United States, and that's because he has the setup and the facility to do a larger scale distribution. And so that's how you get these incredibly nuanced, beautiful cheeses that are then, you know, very precisely and beautifully aged by these affineurs. And um, then the affineurs help to send them throughout the world. And so we try to go to the Pyrenees every uh, two years or so to, you know, reconnect and hand select our cheeses just to make sure that we maintain and establish those relationships. Um, this is a cheese that we import exclusively. Um, at Formaggio Kitchen, I should have mentioned this, we import, um, even though we are three small brick and mortar shops, we do importing directly. And so a huge part of what I do is travel the world and find products that are not yet in the United States. And so we act as our own sort of shepherd to help them register with the FDA, introduce them to the United States. And our goal is not to have any sort of exclusivity contracts. If they want to grow 
We help, you know, we basically, as I said, are shepherds. We bring them to the market and then they do with it as they please. And a lot of them are so small, they don't want to grow, which is great. We help sort of support, you know, this small introduction into the United States and then others grow a lot bigger. Um, Amade, we imported them directly when I first started working at Formaggio Kitchen and now they're fairly widely distributed in the U.S., and it's just a beautiful thing to see if that's the direction that they want to take their company. Um, so the reason I wanted to pair these together is because um, you can imagine the Pyrenees are steeped in tradition and every little village you go to, they have the exact same sandwich. It is brebby on a baguette with cherry jam and it's delicious. And it is absolutely in every little village that you go to. And so when I think about the most classic pairing for Brebi, it is cherry jam. And so the thought then became, okay, what chocolate do we have that tastes the most like dark red fruit like cherry? And so this to me became an obvious, you know, no brainer. And so I love the fact that the richness of the sheep's milk, because sheep's milk out of the three main milk types of cow, sheep, and goat has the highest fat content. So it kind of coats your palate. It's really rich. It's really heavy. And then you have this bright fruit on top of it. And going back to what I talked about before about thinking about flavors as a story, the beginning and the end are very different. So mix up the order in which you taste the cheese and the chocolate. So try the chocolate first and then the cheese and then flip them because sometimes it might work really, really well with the chocolate first, or it might work terribly, but amazingly well the opposite. So that's another really fun thing to explore is the order in which you're trying things. Um, and so I'm, I'm digging in. I know I, I do have to talk, but I also am gonna eat as well. And while I'm snacking, does anybody have any initial questions? A uh, quick question on our end. Yeah. I have my seven-year-old joining me and I've created a monster right here with cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Do you use the crackers to cleanse in between? That is a great, great, great point. A hundred percent, yes. When you're with friends and you know, you're having a party, obviously you want to throw that cheese on the cracker and enjoy it. But when you're doing a very formal tasting, every extra element of flavor matters. And so when you introduce the cracker into the tasting, then it's just a whole other flavor element that you have to contend with. So if you wanna be, as I said, if you really wanna geek out and go very formal, then you want to save the cracker as a palate cleanser. But if you just love cheese on a cracker, then you know, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Like I said, I will not judge for anybody eating cheese in a cracker. <laughs> um, Good question. Question about the sheep cheese. Yeah. Um, so it's really good, but it's like, it's a very subtle flavor that's best had singularly or with like the pairing like you recommended with the chocolate. I, I wonder if there would be, if this is a good cheese to cook with or to put on, to put on anything. Even when paired with jam, I feel like the jam would outshine the subtle, mellow deliciousness. Yeah, I, honestly, that's such a great description of this cheese because as cheese smokers, we adore brebis and sheep smoked cheeses like this. Um, and so we never, we always call them um, nuanced and not bland because there's so much going on, but it's so delicate. But I think what would surprise you is actually the fattiness of it. And because it's so rich, it actually can hold up to more flavor than you'd expect. Um, but I would say this cheese is also, it is nice with cooking. I'd say I would use it more as a sort of raw element with cooking um, and sort of like what I would do with this is if I had a salad, I would take a vegetable peeler and you could vegetable peel like curly cues over the salad. Um, 
this cheese, sheep's milk cheese doesn't always melt the best. Um, so depending on how high of heat you have, sometimes because of the fat content, um, it, um, I'm checking, I see sour cherry jam popping out. Yes. Um, the sour cherry jam with this, I'm sure is incredible, but yeah, I would encourage you to think of this as rather than, um, thinking that the other flavors will overwhelm it, uh, cheeses like this that are really fatty and rich, I kind of think as a beautiful pillow and everything else just kind of gently, you know, rests on the pillow and this cheese kind of elevates them. Uh, this cheese is wonderful with red wine. A lot of times cheeses and red wine can actually be a challenging pairing because cheeses have a lot of natural mold in them and mold tends to draw out the tannins in wine. And so that is something oftentimes if you have a really aggressive red wine, we tell you to steer away from cheese. Cheese is generally like lighter bodied reds, like a Pinot Noir, Gamay, something like that. Um, and so that's something to consider, but this cheese is probably one of the best to pair with almost any wine because it is, it's just sort of that, um, you know, powerhouse that just, it doesn't overwhelm anything else. It's not going to overshadow anything else, but it's got so much fattiness that it will always stay on your palate. Um, it's a fun one to experiment with. Any other questions? All right. So we're going to move on to the next pairing of the night. And I know there's a few folks that came in a little later. We just started with the Brebis du Bern and the uh, Amade uh, red fruit chocolate. We're now moving on to the Comte uh, for San Antoine and to the Di Barbero hazelnut chocolate. All right. So Comte is really where it started for Formaggio Kitchen. Um, does anybody know what Comte is? Has anybody had Comte before? I have you guys on gallery. So if you've got your camera on, you can just raise your hand. Okay, so a couple people have had Comte. So Comte is essentially French Gruyere. Um, the Swiss basically gained rights to the name Gruyere. And at that point in time, uh, the French could no longer call it French Gruyere. So they, uh, change the name to Comte. Uh, so Comte is 80 pound wheels of cheese. And uh, one of my favorite things is looking at the anthropological history of cheese and understanding why cheeses were made the way that they were made, because a lot of it was due to necessity. So if you look at where Comte is made, it's made in the French Alps, um, at the top of the mountains, um, you know, well away from any, any sort of ocean water. And so in the olden days, uh, when you have the way that you expel moisture from cheese traditionally is using salt. But again, when you don't have great forms of transportation, lugging a bunch of salt up a mountain is not really a feasible option. So you have these cows that are grazing in the hillside in the mountains in the summertime. And the cheesemakers, cows can produce quite a lot of milk in the summertime. And so these cheesemakers were making very, very large wheels of cheese. They had to expel the uh, moisture at, you know, somehow, so what this cheese is called, is the exact same as Gruyere, is a cooked pressed cheese. And so what that means, it is not pasteurized. So this is still a raw milk cheese because the milk is raw. But once the curd and the whey is separated, you have all the cheese curd in the big form that will become that 80 pound wheel. Uh, they gently heat it and they have a, a press. And again, in the olden days, it would be a crank and a big wooden round that would just smush the cheese as it's gently heated. And that would expel the moisture from the cheese. Now, as you can see, um, this cheese, sorry, that had some schmutz on it. And by schmutz, I mean chocolate. Let me scrape it. <laughs> so you can see how the cheese is very smooth and consistent throughout. That's because of that pressing technique. 
And Comté is a really beautiful cheese because it is made using summer's milk, um, high alpine milk, uh, I mean, from uh, high alpine grazing cattle. And what that does is it really does matter what the animals are eating. It imparts a huge flavor on the milk. And so in the summertime, they make comté. And then in the wintertime, uh, when the cows are heat eating hay and grain, they are eating, uh, they're making rich, gooey, fatty cheeses because hay and grain creates a milk that is much richer and fattier. And so the most famous of those cheeses is Vacheron Montdor, which we're at the very end of the season of right now. So we only get it in the winter time. And so again, you think about these farmers in the olden days at the market and they have to have, you know, logistically a way to carry these wheels down the mountain and all of those sort of play in to why these are 80 pound wheels that are very flat um, and very wide. So they're very stackable. So very, very easy to stack on a cart and you can carry them to a market quite easily. Um, what's different about these than Gruyere is most Gruyere is aged around 18 to 24 months. Comté has a much wider range. So Comté can start in the range of about 12 months and then it goes all the way up to 36 months. And so at Fromagia Kitchen, we carry anywhere from seven to eight different types of comté, and they all differ based on age. Um, I love sharing the comté Fort Saint Antoine with you because we have a great relationship with Marcel Petit, uh, the Affineur, the cheese ager that ages these cheeses. And we go every year to hand select our cheeses we plug the wheels, we taste them, and they actually mark them from Agio, and then they ship them over for the holidays. We do that every September. And um, he comes and he does visits without telling us, uh, Philippe, and he inspects. It's really funny because he will come to the shop and he won't introduce himself to anybody. Um, the cheesemongers will say, oh, can I help you with anything? And he says, no, no, I, no, no. And then he goes immediately to the comté and inspects them and makes sure, makes sure that we are caring for them properly. And then, of course, you know, he, we, he, he's eventually found out and we say hello and then we taste through it all with him again. So he can taste how they're aging in our caves um, because we import whole wheels and many, many at a time. We have caves in the basement of Fromagio Kitchen in, uh, on Huron Avenue, Cambridge. So if you are ever in the area, please let me know. Um, part of doing these classes is a free invitation to do a little private cave tour. Uh, kids are welcome. It's a great way to see how uh, to properly care for cheeses over time. And so he inspects them, make sure it's perfect. And every single time, the cheesemongers without fail ask, Oh, I knew my dog was going to start whining. <laughs> the 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 cheese he will uh, the cheesemongers will ask Philippe, which is your favorite comté, and every time he always says, "Well, there is only one comté, and it is for Saint Antoine," because this to him is the true representation of what a comté should be. So let's taste it together. Um, so it should be sweet, it should be savory, and it should be nutty all at once. The younger comtés tend to be sweet and milky. The older comtés tend to be nutty and more oniony and savory. This is sort of the blend of all of them together. And then the chocolate, this is Di Barbero. Um, this is from Northern Italy, very close to actually where, I'd say close-ish to where the Comte is made. Um, you know, you're talking just outside of Milan. And so you're getting up to Northern Italy, getting closer to the Alps. And um, Italy is known for their Piedmont hazelnuts. And what I wanted to do with this pairing, um, is to really show and highlight the nuttiness. And so using the hazelnuts to kind of match the nuttiness that we get in the comté. So
what I love is that you almost get three flavors here because the, the hazelnuts are so prominent. And then you also get the cheese and then you also get the chocolate. And I find when I taste them together, the chocolate really lingers on the finish in a nice way. But then the hazelnuts and the comte play very, very nicely together. Di Barbero is a wonderful, wonderful um, sort of confectioner, I would say, because this is not bean de bar. Um, this is a chocolate where they've taken Covature, which has already made chocolate, and they create their own uh, bar out of it. And so there's, they do more confections like Tyrone and Jean Duya and hazelnut goodies. So that's why I call them more confectioner than a chocolate maker. All right, I noticed that Jackie has a question. I yes, believe. I do. Can you Hi. tell me which one, which one is it? Um, okay, so the one that you had is actually the third one. So oh. neither, the one with the, the big chunks of hazelnut. So it these are the like only this. ones. This is the only thing we received. Oh, you didn't get the, the little hazelnut bark? No. Let me look in the box. Oh, yeah, double check. Box. <laughs> I thought there, yeah. He's looking. <laughs> okay, good. If not, we'll make it up. We'll definitely make it up to you if not. But yeah, let us know. Will do. All Thank right. you. Of course. Any other questions? I see that Nicole has a question. Hi, I'm Clara, and I was wondering what's your favorite place that you went to get cheese? Ooh. You know, that's a really, really good question. Um, I'd have to say two different places because it's hard to choose, but one of them is Paris, which is a very obvious answer um, because there are some lovely cheese shops. Um, Catron is one of my favorites in Paris. And the best thing to do when you go to a cheese shop is to go up to the cheesemonger and say, what do you like right now? and just you are in their hands. And I do that when I travel because they are the expert. It's their cheese shop. And so I want them to take me on a trip. Ray, quiet. <laughs> I want them to take me on a trip uh, and let me experience um, you know, their expertise. Um, the other one I would have to say is in Crete. Um, I tried a cheese that is only made in Crete and it is a very young raw sheep's milk cheese and it's nothing we could ever import into the United States. And it was so representative of the place, the culture that it just, it blew me away. Um, it was a cheese that we would eat for breakfast every day and it was absolutely phenomenal. But again, it's, that is, there are a few things out there that we can't, you know, recreate, um, it, you know, when we come back. And that is the joy of travel um, to a certain extent. But at Fromagio Kitchen, we do try to bring back as much as we can to kind of recreate those traditions and highlight those traditions and foods. All right, any other questions? All right, we are going to move on to our last pairing of the night. And I know there are a lot of kids here tonight, and I would encourage all of you to give the blue cheese a taste, even if it's a teeny tiny taste, um, because, oh, right. So it's a, it's a cheese called Mizithra. And uh, in Crete, it's, uh, it's just, it's very, very soft, and it's made of sheep's milk, and um, it's very, very hard to describe um, because it's so creamy, um, but it has a texture unlike any other cheese I've actually had before. Um, but it definitely is more reminiscent of a fresh farmer cheese. Um, so really, really, really wonderful. And like I said, it's just my goal when I travel is to eat and get recommendations from the locals. And I just go from, I try to find a specialty food shop that seems reminiscent of Fromagio Kitchen where they're really curating the items and I look and I explore and then I talk to the shop 
um, the shop owner usually and get recommendations. And then it all snowballs from there. And that is how we find products. Um, and it's always a track. We always try to go new places. Um, we have the same landing pad. Like I go to Athens every year uh, for a food show, but then every year I go to a different place uh, nearby to explore different foods. So this next month will be Cyprus to because we have not explored Cyprus yet to see if there's anything there that we would want to import. And, and again, and it's about a lot of the producers that we work with aren't online. They're not on the internet. Um, there's no other way to contact them than to visit and kind of explain what we do. So um, yeah, it's, it's not a bad gig, to be honest. Um, uh, we have a lot of fun doing it, but for us, it's, um, we take it very seriously to really respect the product and what they do and the time, um, that they put into it. I grew up on a farm, um, a small farm, uh, in Eastern Oregon, but we, we produced everything, uh, that we ate ourselves. We hunted, we fished, we grew everything. Um, it was sort of a self-sustaining farm. I took care of all the chickens as a kid. Um, and um, it definitely makes you really appreciate what goes into your food. You know, we made, we picked blackberries and made jam and you, that was what I was missing when I came out here for college. And so that's how I discovered Fromagio Kitchen because I was kind of desperate for that connection with food, um, that I wasn't getting in the dining halls. Um, and so I stumbled upon Fromagio Kitchen and, the rest, the rest is history. So, um, all right. So we're going to do what I think is the best pairing. I shouldn't say the best because these are fantastic, but it's the most classic, I think of sort of the chocolate and cheese world, which is blue cheese and chocolate. And the funny thing is, is that if I were doing a chocolate tasting, this would be the first chocolate I would have tasted, not the last, because it is the most nuanced, the most delicate, but I really wanted to pair it with the blue cheese. So, you know, you have to kind of think about the bigger picture when you're doing sort of flights like this and see what works. Um, because I, even though it is nuanced in the world of chocolate, it's going to hold up really nicely to this blue cheese. Now, this chocolate is uh, the Vietnamese chocolate. It's called Maru, um, and the origin here is Lam Dong. And what is really interesting about Maru is that they're one of the few producers, so you see single origin chocolate all over the place. Um, so you often will see uh, origins from Mexico, Peru, Madagascar, Papua New Guinea. Um, they've taken this to a different level. Um, so what they're doing is they're exploring the differences of flavors of different plantations around Vietnam. So all their cacao is grown in Vietnam. And so they're just grown in different regions of Vietnam. And I think it's absolutely fascinating and wonderful to kind of really microanalyze the flavors of chocolate and how they get to be like this. Um, and so this is a, probably one of the more pure versions of chocolate, um, especially that you're gonna have tonight where really the highlight is the cacao, the roast profile. Um, so this is a great, this is a tasting bar. Um, bars that are this thickness are wonderful for tasting because you can get a really nice snack and you can look at the inside of the bar and you'll see there are no air holes. Again, there's little techniques to see the quality of a chocolate. Um, and technically somebody asked about a palate cleanser. Technically when doing a formal chocolate tasting, you wanna have carrot sticks handy um, because that is a wonderful palate cleanser. Uh, tasting chocolate is actually really tiring for your palate and so when you do it professionally, you actually have a big pile of carrots that you nosh on, but that didn't seem to go well with our selection tonight. So we decided to go the cracker route, um, which is a little bit more practical for what we're doing. But if you ever do want to really geek out about chocolate, have some carrots handy, taste them, 
really clear out your palate and taste them side by side because you can really taste the difference of uh, the origin in which they come from. It's fast. It's really fascinating to, to explore. So this one is our Vietnamese one. So we're going to smell it. And it's so fruity on the nose, just like, I mean, I'd say it's almost as fruity as the one with the fruit in it, the literal fruit in it. And then you let it melt. I get notes, and I know this is going to sound dorky, but brownie, which, again, saying what you think matters, because when you think brownie, you're like, okay, what's in a brownie? Butter. And so you've got, that's the fattiness, the richness. Um, and so I get a lot of fruit up front, but then that sort of rich brownie-like flavor in the back. Caroline, did you have a question? Sorry, I didn't mean to get I, you hit up to. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Quick question. Can we purchase, stop eating my chocolate. Can we purchase <laughs> these items again from uh, online? Yes, you may. <laughs> and we're gonna actually, I should have told you all at the beginning, my apologies. This is being recorded. I think Zoom automatically alerts you. So I'm gonna send it to everyone after. Um, as a recording. So it's yours. You can enjoy it. If you want to recreate the camp pairing with friends, by all means, um, we're going to do a ton more of these um, Zoom kind of trainings online through the website, um, just as a way, because a huge part of what we do is share. And I think the stories behind these products are almost as amazing as just enjoying them. And so Hopefully you, you all have a wonderful time tonight. So, all right, now we're getting back to the cheese and it was totally unintentional that this was all French. We have way more cheeses than just French, but again, this was about picking the, the cheeses that made the most sense with the pairing and, um, and the chocolate that we have. And so this is another cheese from the Pyrenees but obviously very, very different than the one that you had already. This is called Blue de Basque. This is one of our mildest blue cheeses. So um, again, kiddos, give it a go. Give it a smell first. And you're gonna get a strong blue cheese, you know, smell. But then when you taste it, it's not gonna be nearly as strong as you'd expect. All right, so you have, again, being a, sh a sheep's milk cheese, a ton of fat really coats your palate. And then what I love is that the blue really kind of bounces around on the top. And this one has almost like a stinging nettle-like quality where it really kind of hits your palate in a bunch of different places and is really bright and a little bit sharp. I love enjoying the chocolate after. Because the blue actually lingers, gray. The blue actually lingers so much that the, the chocolate, it, even though the blue is gone, um, she only ever whines when I have a zoom on. Um, this dog is very well fed and very, very well cared for. <laughs> um, the chocolate, you know, it, it tastes like that blue cheese is um, still in your mouth. Like you still have a chunk of blue cheese in your mouth. And so they play so nicely together. But then if you flip it on its head and try the chocolate first. And I like to chew it up first and really... <laughs> when you put them together what I love about it 
is this is why I love parents so much because you just have two totally different experiences. When you put the chocolate second, you taste the blue cheese. It's very prominent. It's aggressive. And then you taste the chocolate with notes of the blue cheese. They're very harmonious. They, they, but they're very separate. When you try the chocolate first and eat the blue cheese um, together, you know, while you still have some of that chocolate, what I love that it does is it actually tones down some of the funkiness of the blue and you taste more of the nuance of the blue cheese and that's the sweetness. And that's why if you ever have guests, if you love strong cheese and you have one person who hates strong cheese, have a little jar of honey or something like that because honey or some slightly sweet element is a fabulous way to tone down some more pungent cheeses. And so the sweetness of the chocolate is a great way to kind of tone down the pungency of the blue. And you actually end up tasting more flavors in the blue that you wouldn't otherwise be able to try. Um, and I, recommending, I recommend matching uh, flavors with flavors. And by that, I mean, a uh, strong honey with a strong cheese. And so like, for example, we have, you know, things like chestnut honey or buckwheat honey that are known for being intense, dark, slightly funky, bitter honeys. Just because you have a strong cheese doesn't mean that you want to mask it with something super cloyingly sweet like clover honey. If you get a stronger, funkier honey, the two kind of powerhouses mellow each other out and it works really, really, really well. And then the fun happens because you can again, start to taste the nuances that are going on after you take all those sort of more aggressive flavor profiles and you tone them down a bit. And that's why I love pairing because pairing should never be masking one flavor over another. It should be more about, um, you know, creating a new flavor profile. Um, it, that's what it's all about. If you're just masking one flavor over another, then it's not really, you know, a successful pairing in my opinion, because then just eat that one thing. Um, but when you create these new flavor profiles or even better yet, when you start to discover flavors in a cheese or chocolate or anything else that were previously unknown to you because, you know, for whatever reason, maybe there was too, there was too much sort of aggressive mold in the cheese and it needed to be toned down with something sweet. Um, it's a great way to explore different flavors and different tastes. Um, and yeah, no, I think it's just, hopefully y'all enjoyed that pairing, but I want to know some standouts. Oh, okay. Awesome. I got a two thumbs up. That's great. <laughs> so we're going to do a little vote. Um, who liked the first pairing the best? All right, I'm swiping, so keep your hands up. All right. What about, okay, so we got, we've got some good thumbs up here. Okay, what about the second pairing? The Comte and the hazelnut chocolate. Okay, we got some more and you can vote more than once. There are really no rules. Okay, now for the last one, probably could be the most divisive. Who liked the last pairing the best? Okay. I think that the blue cheese might be the winner. That's awesome. Did anybody else try any pairings that were different, you know, different orientation that really blew you away? Anybody have any questions? All right. I see Beth, you have your hand up. Did you have a question? Oh, guess not. <laughs> all right. Well, that is all we have for tonight. Um, my email address is just julia at fromagiokitchen.com. Um, and another email I want to give you all is, uh, cheese at fromagiokitchen.com. 
If you ever have cheese questions, and it does not have to be cheese purchased from us, by all means, please, please email us. We love hearing from you. Um, our goal with our website is to create the same exact atmosphere that you get in our store. We want you to feel like you're taken care of. You have experts who are there to help you. So please take advantage of it. If you're in Cambridge, by all means, let us know. Give me a heads up, shoot me an email, and we can arrange a cave tour. And yeah, that's it. I just really, really appreciate you all taking the time to join us on Valentine's Day and do this chocolate and cheese pairing. I hope you had a great time. I had a great time. I love sharing all this stuff with you. So there'll be many more to come. So thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. So you guys were a wonderful Thank group. you so much. It was awesome. We had a blast. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. I loved it. Thank you guys. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Your you wealth of knowledge amazing. was, what's that? I said, you guys were all amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Your your wealth of knowledge. We were we were skeptics about the chocolate, and um, you definitely broadened our our circle there. So thank you very much. Really well done. Really oh, well. Oh, good, done. good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Thank you, everybody, and thank thanks you. for participating, especially the kids. I love seeing the kids digging in on that blue cheese. That's what I want to see. <laughs> well, this was her birthday present. Oh, happy birthday. Yeah. That's awesome. This, this was her 11th birthday present. So, oh my gosh, happy birthday. Oh, I hope you, you enjoyed it. <laughs> Absolutely. I love all the cheeses. Thank you. Oh, good, good, good. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. All right. Have a great night. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. you, you Thanks. <laughs>